So as some of you may have noticed, I have not posted a video in a few months. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, first, with pre-clerkship classes out of session for the summer, you know, views tend to be lower this time of year. I've also been spending a lot of time working on this project behind me, which will hopefully get its own video once completed. But I wanted to discuss something different today. Recently, while on YouTube, the uh, almighty algorithm recommended Medlife Crisis's organ tier list, where he humorously ranks uh, organs according to how interesting, useful, and potentially problematic they are. It's a great video, I definitely recommend it, um, but I actually already knew it was a great video since I had already seen it. But you know, I was stuck at the airport for a long flight delay, so I decided to watch it again. And as I watched, since the jokes are familiar, I found myself thinking about something a little more deep than what I think Dr. Francis intended. That deep thought, organ systems, are kind of dumb. Now, that might not seem deeper than labeling the heart as God tier, but I promise you I'll get to that deep point in a few minutes. But first, let's consider what defines an organ system. That is, how do we determine how to partition the body into discrete subdivisions? Why do we conventionally consider the body to have separate cardiovascular and pulmonary systems rather than a single combined cardiopulmonary system? Why is the liver and the appendix both part of the gastrointestinal system when their function, anatomy, and importance could not be more different? So let's take a look at some of the considerations we can take when deciding how to bundle individual organs and tissues into systems. The most basic division could be anatomic proximity. Organs and tissues are, that are in close proximity you know, they get bundled together. So the gallbladder and liver are both part of the GI system because they're right next to each other. But after only like five seconds of thought, you, you'll realize that this is obviously a terrible system of categorization. You know, for example, the kidneys and adrenal glands are in extremely close proximity, but have very little to do with one another. And the same as the stomach and the spleen, as well as the bladder, uterus, and, and rectum. So no, anatomic proximity should probably be irrelevant for defining most organ systems. One might speculate that embryologic origin is an incrementally better way to categorize systems. Unfortunately, and you may just need to take my word for it, that ends up being way messier than you might initially guess. Uh, even individual organs do not map nicely to specific germ layers in the embryo, let alone entire systems. It's safe to say that most people rightfully assume that organ systems are defined based on physiologic function. The function of the heart and blood vessels is to transport oxygen and waste products around the body, so that becomes the cardiovascular system. The function of the testes, ovaries, uterus, and placenta is the creation of offspring and the next generation in the species, so that becomes uh, and is labeled the reproductive system. But this way of compartmentalizing organs also breaks down really quickly. For example, what do you do with organs that have more than one function, which is nearly all of them? A commonly discussed organ with functions spanning more than one system, and the one that probably comes to mind first for you, is the pancreas, since it both produces insulin, glucagon, and other hormones, seemingly make it, making it part of the endocrine system, while the pancreas also produces digestive enzymes, making it part of the GI system. The dual system nature of the pancreas is, pr is pretty bread and butter high school level physiology stuff. But a less uh, obvious example are the kidneys, which not only produce urine as a consequence of homeostatic mechanisms, but the kidneys also produce hormones like renin that affects blood pressure, erythropoietin which causes the bone marrow to increase the production of red blood cells, and active vitamin D which is a central player in bone metabolism. But have you ever heard someone claim that kidneys belong in the endocrine system? You know, I've been teaching med school for a really long time, and I certainly have never heard this. However, a person could no longer uh, could no easier live without the endocrine function of the kidney than one could live without the endocrine function of the pancreas. So, you know, why do we consider the pancreas to belong to two organ systems, but the kidneys belong to just one? It it doesn't really feel logical to me. And then to which system should we assign the muscles, specifically skeletal muscles? You know, historically, they are considered their own separate system, yet anatomically and functionally, they seemed, it seems like they should be lumped with the skeleton as a unified musculoskeletal system. But also many diseases clinically fall, or muscular diseases that is, uh, clinically fall under the umbrella of either neurology 
or immunology slash rheumatology. And, you know, speaking of neurology, what about the brain? If we are organizing systems primarily by function, I'd argue that the autonomic nervous system and most of the brainstem has a dramatically different function in the body than consciousness in higher executive functions like language and problem solving. But they both get lumped together as part of the nervous system, specifically the central nervous system, because they're both part of the same organ, the brain. Which goes back to wondering if maybe anatomy and embryology actually do have some role in helping to categorize organ systems. You know, I could go on for an hour or maybe two hours with all the examples in which our uh, uh, common classification of organ systems breaks down. As another more general illustration of how arbitrary these divisions are, let me ask you a very simple question, or a de deceptively simple question. <laughs> how many organ systems do humans even have? You know, if you Google the question, the overwhelming majority of results state 11, typically providing a list like this. You know, I don't know where this list comes from or where it originated, but it's a safe bet that some form of it predates our contemporary understanding of what all our organs even do, let alone how they are interrelated. You know, for, imagine for a moment that you took an anatomist or a physiologist or a physician with all the knowledge of the human body that we currently have, except for some reason in this parallel universe, no one had ever considered organ systems before. And you task that person with creating a higher level organizational framework to how we think about organs to find however the person thought was most logical. They would not come up with this list of 11 systems. The list only feels relatively accurate to us because this is how we've been taught to think about it since elementary school. You know, the fact, quote unquote, that we have a separate GI system, an endocrine system, and reproductive system, it's become hardwired in here. However, I'm really not sure it accu accurately represents how we should be thinking about the relationships between organs any more than the so-called four food groups of the 70s and 80s accurately represented how we should have been thinking about nutrition. You know, they are both overly simplistic models created during a time when we had an insufficient understanding of how this stuff actually works. In other words, organ systems, specifically the traditionally defined organ systems, are dumb. So if lumping organs into these discrete systems is a poor reflection of physiology, why do we do it? You know, one explanation is that our minds naturally need to learn, understand, and remember information in discrete chunks. You know, we're not able to, you know, download all knowledge about the human body instantaneously as a single block of information, but rather our minds learn knowledge fact by fact, chunk by chunk. So some division of information, even if relatively arbitrary, is necessary. It's also natural to assume that lumping organs helps to understand function and pathology better than if we were to uh, teach and learn individual facts devoid of any higher level organizational structure to the information. Superficially, this seems obvious, but as I've been discussing, it's not always true. And this is getting, to, uh, getting us to the, the, the deeper point that I promised at the beginning, you know, why our current model of organ systems can be problematic. When we take our master list of organs, Every time we make a relatively arbitrary decision as to how we bundle them into systems, we aid in the understanding of some diseases, while at the same time, we create very real gaps in our ability to understand other diseases. At the beginning of 2021, I started a new series on this channel dedicated to underappreciated diseases. These are diseases that are uh, undertaught in school, they are underdiagnosed in practice, and they are frequently misunderstood by healthcare professionals. A common link between most of the entries in that series, most fall into the cracks between traditional organ systems. For example, the physiology manifestations of POTS falls between the cardiovascular and nervous systems. Cyclic vomiting syndrome and gastroparesis fall between the GI and nervous systems. And dress is in the cracks between the skin and immune systems. And Bichette's, well, Bichette's kind of falls into the cracks between all of the, the organ systems. You know, the same is true of many so-called multi-system diseases that are often poorly understood by healthcare professionals. You know, things like lupus, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, the vasculitides, etc. But this doesn't just happen with relatively uncommon diseases. We also see it with pathology that is usually thought of as single organ diseases. You know, for example, consider how much easier 
the human dynamics of heart failure is to understand a topic which is usually presented as physical principles isolated to the cardiovascular system as compared to something like the neurohormonal influences on myocardial function or as something like the mysterious cardiorenal syndrome. Is this because the neurohormonal influences on the myocardium are uh, intrinsically more complex than the fluid mechanics behind hemodynamics? You know, I don't know. I, mean, it's, I, I suppose it's a matter of opinion, but I would guess it's not. You know, fluid mechanics is pretty complicated. Instead, I suspect it's because when we learn physiology in medical school and in college and high school before that, you know, we're taught about the heart and blood vessels as a relatively independent, discrete entity. So any physiological phenomena that are isolated to the discrete, classically described cardiovascular system will forever be easier to understand. Meanwhile, few if any direct connections were, were made between the heart and the nervous system or the heart and the endocrine system. You know, by the time we first hear about these connections, you know, either as senior medical students or as interns and residents, or in some cases, not until we're fellows, you know, our brains have already partitioned prior knowledge that will always make it more difficult to see how everything fits together and more difficult to understand the full picture. This leads to a decreased capacity to understand any physiological phenomenon that spans more than one system, and it leads to a decreased capacity to accurately diagnose and treat diseases caused by a disruption of such phenomena. In summary, every decision that's made regarding how we partition, compartmentalize, and teach knowledge about anatomy and physiology, decisions made by scientists, anatomists, med school professors, textbooks, uh, textbook authors, uh, and, and even, yes, medical YouTubers, they all risk creating or reinforcing cognitive barriers that prevent understanding and diagnosing diseases that span multiple organizational units. Unfortunately, I don't have an obvious solution to this problem, but I think a good first step is recognizing it's an issue. A good second step is to deliberately make connections between superficially disparate types of information as early and as frequently as possible. So for example, in my ongoing video series on cardiovascular physiology, which yes, I know it's ironic, I anticipate a future video on the nervous system's influence on, cardio, uh, on cardiac function, as well as one on the influence of hormones. But more centrally, I also wonder if the fundamental model of organs being organized into the familiar systems needs to be updated to reflect science's contemporary knowledge of how much interconnectedness exists within our bodies. You know, I don't know what that model would look like. I, I wish I did, and I don't have any specific proposal. However, if someone could devise one that was an accurate reflection of how everything actually does work, and if it were to be implemented, I think it would help to close a lot of gaps in understanding and ultimately would lead to better patient care. Anyway, that's all I've got for today, but I'm back now with a more frequent upload schedule. If anyone has ideas for an alternative top-down framework for teaching and understanding physiology, or if you think I'm, I'm totally uh, wrong and out to lunch on this issue, either way, please share in the comments below.